Hello, welcome to everyone who's already joined us. Um, let's wait for a couple of um, minutes um, so everyone has uh, the chance to join us on Zoom. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A tool to post your questions. See you in a bit. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Hanny Henry. Hanny, would you please join us for the discussion? Thank you. Thank you Hello. very much. Thanks for your wonderful uh, talk. Thank you very much. Um, my first question. Um, would be so thanks for explaining very specifically how you approach the sample and also how this is what like really hit me in your talk that it was like really wonderfully explained how you approach them and also how delicate it is and important to consider uh which terms we use and how we approach individuals when we're doing research right um so my question, because this is also kind of, um, yeah, keeping me up at night when I do my research is, how can we make sure we are not reproducing cultural and gender stereotypes when we are doing our research? You know, so that, that to me always seems to challenge. Maybe you can, um, yeah, tell us a little bit uh, about how you approach this challenge. That's an, that's an excellent question, actually. And that's why I am very uh, keen on doing qualitative research because the idea is really not about making generalization, but, but it's about uh, theory building, as I said in my presentation. So we, I always end my, um, my, my papers or my research with a limitation section and distress, uh, I'm stressing that I am not making generalization, I'm just, doing uh, in-depth analysis, analysis, expanding a theory, make it more culturally relevant. And I've actually done this uh, with my study on women empowerment. I even did this with uh, my study on Egyptian gays. So it, it, we're not, the, the stereotyping comes when you come and say, this is, uh, the, the this is the result, this is empirical. I, 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 I'm challenging everybody with my result, but, I'm, I'm taking it from a different approach. I'm taking it from a qualitative approach. And so I, I, there are always exceptions. I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody is misinterpreting their religion, or I'm not saying that everybody is societally, societally or socially oppressed. That's why they were as women. We're just, uh, we're just talking theoretical here and we're, we're building a theory. Uh, I think the generalization and stereotyping comes when you come with empirical uh, studies, not to criticize empirical studies, but this is where people say, okay, yeah, this is a, this is a study that has proved so-and-so about a certain culture. And I, I feel like when you study cultural issues, you need to be extra sensitive about making generalization. 
Thank you. Um, a question um, sent in by um, one participant uh, of, your of our audience. I have a question about the concluding comment and about how telling men don't isn't effective, but it may instead be more effective to acknowledge that men have attraction and uh, to not act on it. So the question is in starting with acknowledging the sexual attraction of men towards a woman, does this not contradict the statement that sexual harassment is actually not a sexual act, but a sexist one? Okay, I, I, what I'm trying to say is like, when you do programs, um, they tell people don't, 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 right? And I was talking about the human psychology here. Like when you, when you tell people don't, 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 they do it. Uh, in the Egyptian uh, colloquial, we say everything that's forbidden is desired. So I was just focusing on an approach with men, right? But I don't think it does contradict the idea that it is um, a sexual act because the acting on it is the sexist act. So, so if I already have attraction towards women, that's pretty normal, but abusing my privilege and exploiting women's um, underprivileged position in my society, that turn it into a sexist act. So when you act on it, that's where you are abusing your privilege and your, uh, your act in a sexist way. So I don't think they contradict, but we also need to tell people that the programs that they're having right now, they do the opposite effect because um, they don't explain many aspects and they don't also uh, see where men, some men come from. So you were talking about the development of the programs and of the support. And I was thinking um, this kind of normalizing and downplaying of sexualized violence that we find in a particular society is this, would you say, kind of reflected also in how accessible structures of support are in Egypt? Are they easily accessible? Do women know where to get support and where to get empowered and where to find, where to have a safe space to discuss um, issues like this? Well, I think, to be honest, like the, the, there are tough legislations against sexual harassment and, um, but, when it comes to prosecution, this is where the blockage happens. And many women wanted to go forward and press uh, charges against many sexual harassers. And so the message that sometimes they get um, is, okay, you're shaming yourself, you're shaming your family, or the message they get is the blaming the victim. It's like, because you dress like that. There was actually a, a few women that got arrested in the last uh, month because they are having some sort of provocative uh, social media accounts where they dress in a certain way. So there was always, there's always the, 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 so these women were easily arrested than men who harass. It's easier to arrest women. So the message is blaming the victim. Unfortunately, that's what they get. And it's not just that the government does that, it's the society itself. So I've seen a, a man who harassed a woman and she really starts screaming. So the message is getting, uh, I'll say it in Arabic, I'll translate it, which means, come on, you're gonna ruin his future. And the idea of, of, of people kind of colluding with what happens out of, um, out of blaming for women or out of um, normalizing it. Uh, but I can't, I can't deny that the legislations are very tough, but I don't think the legislation is enough. We really need to have sense of awareness and uh, pe people need to understand uh, this is the societal structure. It's not just government and reinforcement of laws, but it's the society itself and whether it's standing uh, against this or not. So I suppose in Egypt, there's also a lot of feminist activism, right? Um, is there a Me Too movement in, in Egypt? I think there was, uh, uh, it, 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 you can only see them in social media, of course, but yes, and there were, uh, I remember there was a famous um, TV car uh, character, uh, in, he's in Germany now, and uh, 
I think uh, they really uh, canceled his show uh, because, you know, there has been an incident of sexual harassment and a woman who actually came out and, and said it. And actually we have also the, the player, uh, soccer player, Amr Warda, who, but that's the sad part. They removed him from the national soccer team because of his sexual, because of sexual harassment allegations. But then under societal pressure, because we want to win the cup, they put him back. So I think we, it, people are a little bit shy in talking openly about um, their own sexual harassment, but the social media has always been a place where things change and happen. So I'm very optimistic that people will, will use that uh, in a positive way uh, to, to send a message. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, in the audience. Sure. What you have discussed is maybe not only about the act of harassment in the streets, but also about public space in general and who claims public space. Do you think that even got worse during the COVID-19 measures, women are forced to stay inside the house? So it's about like the question, what about the public space? Who claims it? Uh, that's a very, very good question. I think uh, COVID-19, um, I think it has made things better <laughs> because um, I think people, People start to realize to empathize because one of the one of the, the the core issue of this when you intervene in something like that, um, you want to tap into people's ability to empathize and uh, and so for people to be locked, men to feel locked up at home because they're afraid of an of an enemy like the COVID. Hopefully, this will help them understand that or empathize with the fact that many women cannot go out in the streets um, feeling safe and, and able to do their thing without being harassed. So I think that hopefully this kind of empathy may allow men to share the public space and to understand uh, how hard it is for women to walk in the streets. I'm sure, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but I think it's a wonderful opportunity for men to reflect on their privilege and to empathize with the in disabling environment that does, do not, does not allow women to walk freely in the streets. There's another question. The answer to the question just uh, asked is interesting since it demonstrates that unlike other countries, domestic violence is not much of a problem. Um, would you agree or like is it Domestic violence, we hear that like it's a huge public discourse that the numbers increased dramatically uh, during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Yeah, I, I think I said that in one of my uh, interviews uh, is that I expect, I predicted that there would be a rise of uh, domestic abuse. Um, I think it's, it's pretty much um, that everybody needs to give up some of their privileges and, and so um, th this is the part of identification with the aggressor as if there is this uh, virus that oppresses me. So I'm kind of like displacing it into um, people in my house, people in my, someone, my wife, my kids. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think uh, the, the concept of, or, or, or uh, domestic abuse can be also explained using feminist theory about privilege and about displacing uh, our own uh, anger. Yeah. I was thinking this question um, kind of reminded me when I was um, going outside once um, here in Cairo, um, I was recognizing that suddenly in my neighborhood, there is almost only male um, individuals in the streets gathering around their cars. And I was kind of recognizing that women seem have to disappear. So I was thinking, do you think that this uh, COVID measurements also kind of contribute to um, 
for the trad traditionalization of, of gender work um, roles, because other than that, I know that um, there is a lot of uh, women in uh, higher education, like increasing numbers of women um, who do work. So do you think like this is something that could potentially be threatened by the COVID lockdowns? And this is kind of also in line, and again, the same question, who claims to public space right now? And who's like more inside the houses and um, does the care work? Well, I, I think, um, I, I'm not generalizing, but for many women now are, are doing their work at home and they're also doing a double shift with their families because a lot of women, even the privileged ones cannot, bring in domestic workers that can help them because of fear of the transfer of the virus. And so I think you're right. I think the COVID-19 has further uh, solidified the gender role stereotyping because now a lot of people are expecting women, especially like working women, to do the stuff, the traditional work at home, the, the laundry, the cooking, the but even with the poor uh, class as well, uh, the, the idea that, uh, that people cannot work at home because they, they, they do certain types, but then they don't have the opportunity because of the lockdown to the, their crafty work. Then again, so you're supposed to stay home. You're only going out because you have to work, but now stay home, going back to your traditional role as a caregiver as the mother, as a, um, a babysitter, as, a, as someone who raises kids. So I think that's a provocative question to think about how, how, how privileged uh, or, or, or how underprivileged in the case of women has been even worsened by this, the COVID-19 situation. It's an excellent reflection actually, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Um, did the people you interviewed walk away with any different perspectives that um, did the end of those conversations look like? Well, it, it, you see, it, when you do a qualitative research, you don't, um, you don't take away your subjectivity because your subjectivity is a, is a book of diamond. So I wasn't expected to be as neutral. But I think the line of questioning that, uh, that I had um, Made, made people reflect more about what they said, especially when I re do the restatement. All right, so you're saying to me that you feel one, two, three. And so I, I have to be honest with you that there are some people who would look at me and say, did I say that? <laughs> so so it's, it's like, you know, you're doing the basic clinic, uh, therapy skills, uh, like active listening skills. And then people feel, okay, they start to hear themselves loudly. And then they start to question what they say. But I, I don't think I was I was taking the interview in a place where I was trying to uh, tell them, you know, like how oppressive they may sound. But I wasn't neutral, to be honest. I was I was really interacting with the with the material, but I didn't actively or I didn't act on my lack of neutrality uh, because I really wanted to. I had a, a certain question questions but then there are questions that arise during the interview it was semi-structured but I hope I hope that this is <laughs> that they go out when you hear yourself loudly and when someone restate what you say uh, sometimes you think okay am I right to say stuff like that so yeah I'm I'm hoping Thank you so much, um, Hani, for your wonderful talk and um, for being here to discuss some of the questions with us. And uh, please, everyone, continue discussing um, with each other and uh, Dr. Hani uh, on our Slack channel. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for participating. Looking forward to see you uh, in the next talk. Thanks. Thank you.